All right, I'm going to take a few minutes here to answer some mail that we receive. A bunch of letters here and things. And uh, just going to read a number of these. There's a bunch more uh, that I'm trying to deal with and everything else. But uh, just so you out there know that uh, uh, just it's not just an online ministry. I do get a lot of offline correspondence as well. Here's a letter. It says, uh, Brother Brian, we are a saved family of four who listen to you on YouTube. We believe the King James Bible to be the Word of God and have for many years. We have nobody in our area that believes it. Therefore, we stand alone. Here's a check to help support your ministry. We appreciate your stand on the Word of God. God bless you and the name. Um, so there you go. Uh, thank you for your support of the ministry. And as far as the thing of uh, we have nobody in the area to stand by us and we stand alone, yeah, that's a story for a lot of people. Um, I'm going to get more into the whole church building thing and, you know, the a lot of the pressure that's put on you when you become a Bible-believing Christian. They say, uh, who are you fellowshipping with? Or where do you fellowship at? And the whole deal. Um, if you're going to stand for the truth, you're going to find that you're going to be alone um, most of the time. Uh, not by choice as far as uh, I just, you know, this is what I want. I just want to be lonely and whatever else. Uh, no, it's just out of conviction. You go to the church buildings and it's just social centers and people talking about the weather and sports and politics and whatever else. And you hear lie after lie after lie coming out of the pulpit and you're going, ah, you know, you kind of put up with it for a little while. And then after a while, you kind of try to approach the pastor and you realize he isn't going to change for anything, especially if you're not part of the in crowd. And um, you just finally get so fed up with it and you just feel so vexed in your spirit. You don't look forward to going to church on Sunday morning. Every day you wake up to go to, you know, every Sunday you get up to go to church and you feel, uh, you know, you just, you don't even want to go. If you're a Bible-believing Christian, you know what I'm talking about. Um, another letter here. They sent a couple different things. Um, but I thought this was interesting. It says uh, here, uh, the King James Bible says, Then the earth shook and trembled. Foundations of heaven moved and shook because he was wroth. New American Standard Bible says, Then the earth shook and quaked. The foundations of heaven were trembling instead of the earth. Um, you know, so, and were shaken because he was angry. So it says, Please do a search on God's glory in the King James Bible and see the new translation's differences. I'm sure. I know that the new uh, international version has taken the name of Jesus out a bunch of times and they've you know, removed God's name quite a few times and changed it and whatever else. So, um, yeah, it's an interesting point you brought up there. Another letter here. Dear Mr. Denlinger, several years ago I looked online searching for a KJV Bible suitable for purchase and ran across your video. After listening, I bought one from David, David Allen Hoffman called the Common Man's Reference Bible. It is an excellent work, and I use it every day along with my somewhat tattered KJV I purchased in 1983. The Bible is so full of notes, etc., that I thought it time to at least give it a rest and to just use it uh, as an old reference to my growing in Christ over the last 35 years. This one was printed in Great Britain at University Press, Cambridge, and has served me well. My coming to Christ began at a very early age, being tutored by my grandmother in the 1950s. Memorization was her way of instruction, and I was told by her that all I would ever need in life was this King James Version Bible, <clears throat> KJV Bible, and to never let anyone take it away from me. Wise grandmother. As I grew up in the, uh, as I grew up, the world would influence me in many ways, and as was my course, the influence of the KJV took a backseat to other things I found more interesting. It wasn't until I started my own business in 1979 that I realized I would need the help of God because almost all of my friends and relations were telling me not to and what, and, and that I would fail if I even tried. I retired from this successful business in 2015 and will turn 70 in two months. My wife and I moved from central New York to our new home at this time, and I am enjoying our new location just outside of Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. All through my business years, my Bible has been my close companion. I kept another copy out in plain sight at work for those whose inclination would stir up a conversation and realized how lacking and, more importantly, how confused the general church-going population 
was considering the truth of God's Word. Absolutely. I mean, I was raised in church buildings. I didn't understand anything about the Bible version issue. And there was, in fact, one of the um, kind of a, I don't know if he was a deacon, but he was kind of a, a very popular name in the church building I grew up in. And uh, his name was Roy Kreider. And uh, he started to raise some issues about the Bible version thing because our pastor, Bob Reed, Calvary Monument, Calvary Monument Bible Church there in Pennsylvania, um, he was a new version advocate. And Roy Kreider started to bring up some stuff about the King James Bible, and he was basically told to leave. And there was a big fuss over the whole thing, and it was just this nobody's allowed to talk about it kind of a thing. So... Yeah, I know what you mean about the church building thing. People are very ignorant. But it's, continue, it says here, This led to all the Bible per perversions I began to see clearly, even in my own church, and also how dead to the world most Christian people are concerning this single issue. It has been many years now, and the pro progression of apostasy is almost overwhelming. Yeah. Yet through it, it all, our path has never been more clear and I am thankful for your videos and to those who aspire to God's perfect word found only in the King James Bible. Amen. Absolutely. Uh, it's, you know, it is depressing sometimes to see apostasy getting worse. But as it gets worse, we know that our stands that we've taken are correct. Because, you know, by their fruits ye shall know them. Uh, the fruits of the new versions have been uh, just total apostasy within the church buildings out there. They're just falling apart. So, absolutely. Here's another one. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm keeping names private and things on these. Um, <clears throat> this one's from Canada. Ryan, I thank the Lord for your wonderful, wonderful work and clarity you have brought to me with regards to the Holy Scriptures. Although, in your, although your approach is often harsh and possibly even rude to some, I am so grateful for your teachings that I have been following regularly for about a year. The Bible says, May your speech be with grace, seasoned with salt. The more I delve into the teachings of the KJV and in turn live by faith in Christ, the more alienated I feel I have become from family, co-workers, neighbors, etc. Exactly what the Bible teaches. <laughs> it's exactly true. Just like the other family there wrote in their letter. I've been trying to I've been trying on and off to find contact info with regards to sending you donation. He gets into some of this stuff. Um, not gonna get into a whole lot of this. So yeah, it just says a few more things about that. So again, thank you for your support very much and uh, for your letter. It's always encouraging to hear how the Lord is using this ministry to help other people. Um, here we have one. Uh, another handwritten letter here. Um, Dear Brian, what a great honor you have been given to preach the Word of God. I have been saved recently and I am in the process of removing the things in my life that the Lord would not approve of. In my mind, I have many questions that maybe you could help me with and maybe others will be helped as well. They are as follows. Okay, question number one. I don't understand how the kindreds of people could come from one family. Since Noah is perfect in his generation, in his genealogy, in other words, he can not produce an Asian, a black, or anything like that is not in his genes. Just like two white people cannot produce a black baby. So where do the kindreds come from if they are all destroyed? Uh, good question. Um, I don't believe that, that Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, I don't think they looked any different from each other. Um, you take a pure, what, what the pure look of those three would have been, um, you can see the same thing today in, you take an Egyptian, that's, they're technically Hamitic. Uh, the Bible talks about Egypt uh, being the land of Ham. So you take a Hamite, an Egyptian, a Jew, and say an Italian or maybe somebody from Spain, um, they look almost exactly alike. There's not much difference there, and yet it's, Ham, Shem, Japheth. All right, but what happens is when you start to move out and there's inbreeding within a select group, they're going to start to produce certain genetic traits. All right, so I don't, in other words, I don't believe that Japheth had blonde hair and blue eyes or anything like that. He had dark hair, dark eyes, just like his two brothers did. 
but as the one family splits off and they go and you have, um, you know, obviously right after the flood, they would have been marrying brothers and sisters. There would have been that, you know, I hate to use the term inbreeding because it sounds really bad and it's inbreeding today as a sin, certainly, and wrong and genetic suicide, essentially. But after the flood, there wouldn't have been a choice. There weren't any other families there. So they were marrying brothers and sisters and then it turned into marrying cousins and things. But you could get a, a certain family that splits off and, and goes a certain direction and there's two, you know, a child is born here that's blonde haired and blue eyed and one's born over there that's brown hair with blue eyes or something we'll say. They produce children and those children and those children and, and they're inbreeding between those descendants. You're going to get blonde hair, blue eyes with some of the Europeans. You're going to get darker skin going down into Africa. The Shemitic people, you're going to start to get some of the Asiatic type of look. So it's, you know, as you're getting away from the creation, I mean, you can say, well, how did Noah have all that? Well, how did Adam have all of that? You see, the, the races are traced back to one couple, Adam and Eve, right? And they came down through and they, they was spreading out and then it went to Noah and his three sons and their three wives and Noah's wife too. And it spread out from there again, all right? Um, just the same thing as they're, you know, continuing to genetically produce different types of dogs and whatever else. Well, the dogs originally would have been your wolf type of dogs, your coyotes and wolves and foxes and whatever else. But you can genetically, you know, segregate certain strains and you can create different varieties there. So that's what happened. It's not that there was, you know, Hamites and, you know, we'll say Africans and, and Northern Caucasian Europeans and Asiatics before the flood. Uh, I don't see that from scripture. That stuff came after the flood. So with the three sons, <clears throat> that's how I'd answer that. Question number two, I also don't believe in church buildings, but how do I find others uh, that are my brothers and sisters in Christ? Well, um, that's something I really firmly believe that uh, when you get saved, that it's a real good thing to just really get to know the Lord. And a lot of that is going to be just you and Him. Um, if you're married to a saved you know, husband or wife or whatever, um, of course, you're going to have that great fellowship there. Uh, but you really need to study the Bible, really need to learn the Bible. And I think, you know, I have a study on the isolated Christian and perfection. Um, Christians don't want to spend much time alone with the Lord. Um, as I've said, you know, it'd be kind of weird you know, in my study. I said this, it'd be weird if I said that I don't ever like to be alone with my wife. I always got to make sure that there's other people around, you know, when I'm around my wife. Well, that'd be strange, but we're espoused to Jesus Christ. We're going to be presented as a chaste virgin to Jesus Christ someday. And you don't want to spend time alone with him. It's very strange. All right. Um, I'm not saying Christians have to be alone by themselves all the time, but sometime some alone time with the Lord is a good thing, okay, um, certainly. But once you get through that time there where you have developed that personal relationship, where you're not looking at other Christians and what are they doing and following what the crowd does because you know the Lord personally, you know His Word, then you're ready to start fellowshipping with other believers. Certainly, you need to, you know, you need to develop that personal relationship with the Lord. So how do you do that? Well, uh, one of the big ways is online right now. You can certainly meet a lot of people, very interesting people. Um, you know, I developed the Patreon page so that people could come there and fellowship with one another. And I know that there are some people that are on there that are actually meeting up in their local areas and things. They're saying, hey, I'm from such and such area too. Wow, that's great. You want to meet up sometime? Yeah, great. Sure. Fine. That's good. Um, another thing is... When you learn the Word of God, the Lord can use you as an ambassador of Jesus Christ to go out and witness to people. You know, you, you get somebody saved and, uh, you know, bring them to the Lord for salvation. The Lord saves them and you can start to fellowship. Uh, again, that's kind of the idea here, um, to be spread out, not to be clumped together in church buildings. All right, that, there's a great danger in that, in that you, you know, the bigger the church building, the more compromise has to be there. I mean, think about that. Uh, if you have three Christians together, 
Well, how much compromise do you have to do? Maybe not that much. If you have 3,000 Christians together, how much comp compromise has to be there? A whole lot, especially nowadays. All right. Um, so the, the whole church building thing is, is a, it's false on so many different levels. Um, you know, there are, there are ways that you can meet Christians online. Um, I mean, a good thing that you can do. I'll tell you another great way to, to find Christians is put bumper magnets on your vehicle or bumper stickers on your vehicle about the Lord. Um, wear a t-shirt that has Bible verses on it or whatever else. And you'll be, I mean, I can't tell me how many times I've been places and, uh, you know, I'll get somebody and they'll, they'll come up and they'll say, hey, I like your bumper sticker. And I'll turn to them and say, oh, are you saved? You know, or are you Christian? And you get to talking to them. You'll get into a, a great, uh, you know, conversation with them. I've, I've met a lot of people that way uh, that are saved. So, you know, there's different ways to do it. But thinking, well, you know, the church building thing is where I'm going to meet people and whatever else. Uh, you're going to find when you go to a church building that most of the people are worldly and lost, quite frankly. Even the best uh, Baptist churches are filled with lost people. Number three, I have never been married, but I want a wife. How do I find a Christian woman if I don't go to church? Um, well, again, uh, you can witness to a lost woman and later to the Lord and then marry her. That's what I did. Okay, I mean, I met my wife, uh, she contacted the ministry and was asking questions and I ended up, you know, told her how to get saved. She got saved, you know, and, and we started writing back and forth and, and you know, here we are today. But uh, as far as meeting a Christian woman, again, oh, it's, it's safe to go to some church building someplace and meet a Christian woman. You don't know that. Or you, you really don't know that. Uh, I've seen some some pretty filthy women, you know, and you hear about things and whatever else and you go to these church buildings. Uh, people have this weird notion that church buildings are a safe place. They're not. And you get a woman in one of those places, I've, I've met some really greedy, covetous women that go to church buildings. So look out for that. Um, and again, you know, you pray about it. I mean, does the Lord need to have a church building in your area that to provide a wife for you? Or... Can the Lord provide a wife? You see, are you doing your part to serve the Lord? Are you reading His Word? Are you growing? Are you going through the process of sanctification or whatever else? Um, I had sin in my life that, looking back now, I realize why it went so long before I got married, because I wasn't giving those sins up. The Lord had to get me to a process of sanctification, or I'd, I would have destroyed a marriage was the kind of sin that I was messing around with. Maybe there's a problem there, too. Get things sanctified out of your life, and the Lord can bring you a wife in, in the most amazing circumstance, and all of a sudden you're going, wow, this is amazing. Something to think about. Okay, question number four. Jesus is God, so how can Jesus be a Jew? I speak genetically. Okay, um, Jesus took on the form of a man when he came to the earth, right? Uh, he, I wouldn't say he was Jewish in heaven or anything in terms of, uh, you know, he's a Jew before the Jews came around. No, no, no. He came to his own and his own received him not, all right? The Bible talks about um, when he came down to the earth, he was born of a woman. It doesn't mean he didn't exist before then. He just, you know... Again, we're getting into the mystery of godliness, so you kind of start scratching your head going, okay, I don't know how that works. It's a mystery, all right? But God there, composed of the Lord Jesus Christ as the body, God the Father as the soul, Holy Ghost as the spirit, he, his body changed and became a baby, all right? God the Father did not come down and have, you know, physical relations with Mary, all right? The, he overshadowed Mary. And Jesus, however that thing worked, he went down in there and he became in her womb as, you know, a, a little baby in there. And then the baby grew and he, she went through the whole childbirthing process and everything else. He comes out, he's walking and talking, he's born now, he's got the body of a Jewish man. He had blood, you know, physical blood. He could feel pain. He could 
feel all the things that we feel as just mortal men. He came down and he had that body. So um, it wasn't that he was genetically Jewish before then. It's just he took on the form of a servant. He took on the form of man when he came down here, born of Mary, without a mortal man as his father, in other words. Number five, also I have not heard of any music or uh, starting study materials a recently saved person should have on your channel. Um, what should we study and listen to besides the KJV to help us learn commentaries? Um, okay, uh, we'll get into another thing there. Um, music, uh, music is really, really tricky. Um, there's a, you can look up instrumental hymns, old hymns uh, here on YouTube. There's some, there's some good ones uh, out there. There's some of them, they mix in some of the modern stuff with it, but uh, study old hymns. Uh, you can find an old hymn book. Uh, I have one around here somewhere. Um, yeah, right here. This one here is okay. Uh, Living hymns. You can't even really see the cover anymore, but uh, the the gold gilding is or the gold lettering is all worn off. But um, this is one I used for years and years. But you know, you just go through and and uh, you know songs like. Um, the old rugged cross, or um, you know, nearer my God to Thee. There's one I'm looking at there. Uh, Onward, Christian soldiers. Um, nothing but the blood of Jesus. You know, uh, old hymns like that. You can look up that stuff. Um, you know, there's there's some different styles of of music which are okay to listen to that are not what I would call worldly. Um, stringed instruments, usually stringed and sort of wind instruments, uh, flutes, trumpets, trombones, tubas, whatever. Those are good. Um, you get into a lot of heavy drum beat. Uh, there's rhythm is part of music. It's, it's there. There should be some rhythm to music. Uh, you have harmony, melody, rhythm. But if there's an overemphasis on rhythm where the beat is really hard and driving and it's a drum beat and it's faster than your natural heart rhythm, you're starting to get into some of the real fleshly stuff there. Um, that's a big study, but, uh, you know, um, just, you know, look up some of the instrumental hymns, old hymns, old classic gospel hymns and things, uh, you know, that's good stuff to listen to. As far as commentaries are concerned, commentaries are somewhat problematic. I have most of Ruckman, Peter, Dr. Peter S. Ruckman's commentaries. Um, I will look at them occasionally. Uh, I've never actually read any of them from cover to cover. I, you know, if I just, I'd see something, I think, I wonder what, you know, Dr. Ruckman said about that. I'll just pick it out, you know, and I'll look it up and read a couple pages where he's talking about the verse. They're, they're helpful. They're helpful. Sometimes you, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. That's kind of what I was thinking it was going to say. Um, take it with a grain of salt, you know, because he's not perfect. The Bible's perfect. Um, you know, the, uh, there's study Bibles, uh, Schofield's study Bible. Um, you know, I've heard good things about it. I have one or two, but I've never actually gone through and read a lot of the notes and things. But there's, you know, every every commentary thing out there is going to have some issues. Um, Common Man's uh, Reference Bible, talked about that earlier, one letter. Um, commentaries are okay. Uh, concordance, Strong's Concordance is a good thing that you can do word studies with it. There's a um, E-Sword... Uh, I can't think of the name of the software that I use, but there's stuff that you can get for your computer where you can look up words or phrases and then it'll take you to things and whatever else. Uh, Webster's 1828 Dictionary, right there. Get the paper edition like this, or you can get um, Sword Searcher is what I use. You can get it through them. Uh, <coughs> you know, a lot of different things that you can get. Um, as far as that's concerned. Uh, okay, it says here, uh, further in this letter, Lastly, I support what you are doing for the Lord, and if you need any help, feel free to let me know. Sorry for the writing. I type more than write letters. Well, you can type letters. You know, there are people that, that type letters. There are people that write letters by hand. Um, so uh, that certainly is there. Um, he says, P.S. The Lord spoke to me about what you should do about 
money issues. YouTube will be the way to lead believers to your website. At your website, you will sell DVDs and books of your teaching every topic in the King James Bible. These will be masterfully done and will make it to where you will not have to censor anything and this will ensure only those who desire righteousness will be the one's benefit. YouTube will only be the way to reach the lost sinners. You can also sell the pure text of the KJV that contains no errors or additions because I checked all my KJVs and they all were counterfeit in different areas. I finally found one that isn't, but why not sell these these to people so they can be sure that they get a good Bible? Peace be unto you, brother. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for your letter. Um, as far as the pure Cambridge type of thing and whatever else, um, you know, it's it's mostly just a thing of publishing differences. It's it's you know, you get somebody that has an Oxford edition of the King James Bible and some of the spelling differences instead of Savior being spelled with a U in the end part there. It's just I O uh, R. Uh, you know, I I think S-A-V-I-O-U-R is the correct way to spell it, but you know, you're not going to get led into some kind of doctrinal error or whatever else if you use an Oxford edition of the King James Bible. So, but, uh, you know, I know that there's brethren in, in other countries that have contacted me and said, you know, I recommend church Bible publishers or local church Bible publishers. I know they had a split there. Again, whatever. I, I don't really know a whole lot on that, but I've recommended their Bibles for a long time. Um, they, uh, do I have one here? Yeah, right here. Uh, you know, here's one right here that I have. You know, they make really high quality Bibles, uh, very, very nice King James Bibles, uh, real good stuff, good prices and everything. But I know that they don't ship to some countries and I've had different brethren contact me and ask, you know, can you, you know, could we buy a Bible and, you know, could you buy the Bible and send it to us and we'll pay you for it? And I have done that for brethren. But is there a possibility of me eventually getting into actually distributing Bibles? I don't know. We'll see about that. Uh, you know, that's that requires, you know, some financing on my part. You know, and yeah, I have a bunch of Bibles stacked up around places. And some of them might not sell all that well and whatever. And then i got to, you know lower the prices on them and whatever to get them to move and you know <laughs> I mean I have these Bibles around actually to give away so that can be there too but uh, different ideas um, as far as me producing videos offline uh, that is coming uh, soon uh, right now we are in the process of uh, trying to find a new office for the ministry um, as many of you know some of you don't know uh, we had bought land this past year, and we're currently, you know, building things there, you know, as a new place to live. And uh, the office, you know, for the ministry is going to be down in that area more. Um, we're about an hour and a half away from our property here, so it's kind of rough to be driving between the two. But when we get a new ministry office, we are going to be definitely getting back into DVD production again. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot more offline type of video exactly what he said here more um, not so much of this this backdrop with my bookshelf and whatever that I've used on YouTube for years um, and even in my DVDs some of the DVDs I think the uh, ridiculous Bible perversions of the new age and the house church you know, starting a house church based on the King James Bible um, those two were done with the bookshelf backdrop but we're going to be working on some new studio things and whatever else there um, and producing a lot more video. I'm uh, going to be putting um, all of my YouTube videos that I've done in the last nearly 10 years, um, the ones that are on the Bible and whatever else, I'm going to be putting all those onto external hard drives and uh, offering those for sale. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. So we're going to be experimenting with a lot of new things and, it, and I am also planning on getting into writing books and booklets as well. That's another angle for the ministry but we can't do it here we're having to restructure the ministry and whatever so um, thank you for your suggestions and uh, your questions as well um, finally I uh, have another letter I'm going to be answering in a separate video but because uh, it gets into a lot of different things but got a letter from a sister in Australia and a really nice card here 
handmade card. Um, she's an artist and uh, really good. Does some really beautiful work. We love stuff like this when we get handmade cards. Um, just really, uh, I love uh, this type of artwork. It's just really, really nice. Um, my grandpa was an artist, so I was kind of raised in an art family. Um, but just, just a neat handmade card. We love things like that. We get, you know, it's a, always special when we get something that's handmade. But uh, she wrote a letter here. Again, I'm not going to say the name, but uh, she's from Australia. And uh, just say this to the brothers and sisters out there. Um, pray for her. Her husband is lost. And, uh, you know, doesn't think too much of the Lord, to say it that way. Atheistic evolutionist. So um, let's lift her up in prayer and uh, give her the right words to say to her husband and pray that the Holy Spirit works on her husband. Right? But I want to read part of her letter um, here. She br brings up an interesting point, which I need to say a few things about. Brother Brian, here are some thoughts of mine on the subject of the catching away. From your standpoint, I understand that you are of the opinion that we shall enter, or excuse me, that we shall either go with or without clothes, and perhaps shall go without clothes and blood. From my observations, I would like to present this idea to you that when we go up to Jesus at the catching away, I think that clothes go with us too, and that we are immediately changed into a better body with the white robes all at once as it were. With this in mind, the clothes issue is kind of irrelevant to me. I really think that there will not be blood left behind. This is because the blood was re relevant since Jesus blood on the cross, bled, excuse me, bled on the cross and he left blood on the linen death clothes they wrapped him in to be in the sepulcher. Then when he appeared before Mary and then his disciples a number of times he was clothed uh, because he cannot manifest his clothes. Also from scripture there is evidence that to go up into the clouds at the catching away just like Jesus when he arose into the sky in front of his disciples as or he went as he was clothed and whole. The Bible reads in various verses that Jesus moved from place to place up into the sky as he pleased without any change in his actual form or dress. It's actually a really good point. Um, you know, I know Ruckman has taught for years that when Jesus died, what did he leave behind? He left behind clothes and he left behind blood. Well, we're not technically dying at the rapture, you know, at the catching up of the body of Christ. Uh, when, when we're called up to be with the Lord, we aren't dying. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up, you know, to meet the Lord in the air. Okay, so we're not technically dying, so why would we leave our clothes and our blood behind? It's a good point. It's a very good point. <laughs> um, it was interesting to also read how Philip in Acts 8, verse 39 through 40, was baptizing the eunuch in the water, then suddenly disappeared and was found in his otis preaching in the cities. Philip kept his clothes while doing this. Um, then she quotes the verses there. Uh, in Acts chapter 1, verse 9, um, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Acts 2, 31 through 32, He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither, did his, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Um, John 20, verse 19, Jesus appeared before his disciples by surprise in a room that was shut. In Luke 24, verse 51, and it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 through 17, it says, For the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. An interesting little study to ponder how we shall change, we shall ourselves go up at the catching away. Thank you for looking at this with me. Many thanks for all you bring to me and all who watch your ministry. It will be wonderful to see you with our brethren when we meet with the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. Yeah, I'm looking forward to meeting a lot of you out there as well. But, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I get some things sometimes from the brethren and I read it and I kind of go, you know, and there's no, yeah, but what about this? There's no argument from me. And I go, yeah, okay, um, Jesus left his clothes and his blood when he died, but when he went up into the clouds, he didn't leave clothes and blood behind. 
uh, you know, you're kind of going, I really can't answer that. Uh, yeah, I think I'm gonna have to change my position on that then. Um, you know, because, you know, another one of the things, Enoch, when he's translated, it says he wasn't found. Uh, okay, well, you can say, you know, well, they didn't find him, but they found his clothes, but that's not in Scripture. So I would say that there's a pretty good chance that when the rapture, catching up, to use the correct biblical term, when that happens, we're just going to be gone. You say, what's the Lord going to do with all the clothes? Uh, I don't think that that's going to be a problem for God Almighty. Okay, I think he has a way that he can just kind of make them disappear or whatever. Give us our robes that we're going to be wearing. So, I mean, I don't think if the, if the catching up happens in the next 10 minutes, I don't think I'm going to be wearing this for all of eternity. You know, I think he can take care of that. So, I thought it was just an interesting thing that Ruckman preached about the thing of clothes and blood being left behind. But that's what Jesus left when he died. We aren't dying. If you're alive, you're not going to be dying when the catching up happens. So, I stand corrected. All right? Um, a lot of people say, oh, you know, Brian Denlinger is too proud to admit to being wrong. I, that, that is a lie. It's an absolute lie. When you see people saying that about me or hear people saying about me, know that it's an absolute lie. Um, there's a sister in the Lord made a very good point in, in love and, and wasn't nasty to me and called me a heretic, made videos exposing me, you know, or something, you know. Just, you know, hey, what about this? What about that? And I look at it and I say, hmm, uh, I think i got to change my position on this. So, okay, okay. Uh, if we're going to go up to be with the Lord the same way he was caught up into heaven, then we're just going to be disappearing. Uh, you're just not going to find anything. So, great point. Thank you to everybody that contacts the ministry. Thank you to all those who support us. Uh, we really appreciate that. Um, really looking forward to some uh, great work getting done in the future. A um, whole new direction for the ministry. Uh, really looking forward to a lot more offline type of things. There's a, actually a letter right here. I was looking at this. I was going to read this one. Uh, <clears throat> this was February 9th, 2018 another letter here and they were saying that that they've been convicted that they're not going to be doing much online stuff anymore so uh, they really wish I'd go back to offline type of things and they believe that I would be better you know do a better job offline and I agree I do agree with that uh, that's been a struggle and I was going to read this letter and go over this but I, it's kind of pointless to read a letter that people just said they're going to go offline and so they're not really going to see it so but I, I take that um, constructive criticism, loving rebuke, that uh, it's a problem with me putting everything out here online, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm realizing more and more that a lot of times I'm just casting my pearls before swine, that are using the work that I do, twisting what I say, lying about me, and just turning again and rending me, and attacking me and trying to rip me to pieces. Um, that's just disgusting to me. And I've seen that over the years, that there's so many people that once supported me and I've, I've put a lot of time into this ministry. I pour my heart and soul into this ministry and they eventually turn on me just like a wild, wild boar and they, they just try to rip me in pieces. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be doing more stuff offline in the future. Definitely. Uh, thank you to everybody that's, you know, again, you know, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. And I'm getting, I've been getting it for a while now from some of the brethren. The thing of, I think you need to pray about going offline again. Going back to the first thing that you used to do, DVDs, you know. And there's some new technology type of stuff out now where, you know, you can um, put stuff on little external hard drives and whatever else and plug it into a high definition television or into a computer or whatever else through USB port and and uh, you can store huge amounts of information on these things. Um, so be bringing out more stuff on that in the future as we uh, you know get things done. But um, just thank you to everybody out there uh, you know that supports the ministry and uh, we're we're in the process right now of looking at a, uh, ministry offices in the area and things. Uh, very low cost, extremely cheap. You know, um, so uh, we would really appreciate everybody's prayer on that.
that the Lord would lead us to the right place and that it would be soon because we want to make things happen. We're really anxious to make this transition. So that is going to be it. And uh, see you in the next video.